action. Nothing was ever going to be the same. Danger. If I slip up or if I turn my eye for just one second, someone could get the drop on me. Adventure. The Amazon River. They have a version of everything in North America except bigger and scarier. You're listening to Sea Story. Episode 41, The Ride. My name is John Minoni. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I'm a Navy pilot and a captain, and this is my sea story. It's 2007. I'm a uh, commander in the Navy at this point, and I'm the commanding officer of a helicopter squadron, which is based out of Guam in the Marianas Islands. Normally, that type of squadron does deployments on ships. One of our primary missions, though, was to do search and rescue or medical evacuation type missions for any of the islands or any of the ships that came through Guam. About the same time, because of the deteriorating situation in Iraq, the National Command Authority, the President and SECDEF decide to do what's called a surge. What the surge was, was pushing all of these troops into Iraq to fight back against extremists and terrorists and whoever else is running around there and trying to keep the Iraqi people oppressed. Because the army was having trouble sourcing that, they didn't have enough helicopters, didn't have enough pilots, they asked our squadron to send about half our squadron to base out of Kuwait and to do what's called dust off or medical evacuation missions for the southern part of Iraq and all of Kuwait. That's a little different for a Navy helicopter squadron to do something like that ashore in the desert flying for the Army. For about 15 months, we based out of Udari Army Airfield, which is in northern Kuwait, and did dust off, medical evacuation type missions. You fly helicopters in, usually two, unless it's something really big, and then it's four to six. Two helicopters in with trauma specialists in the back. You land the helicopters, you gather up who's hurt, you do some immediate care on scene, and then you try and get them as fast as you can, within an hour, they call it the golden hour, to some medical facility where they can be further treated. The golden hour is basically from the time somebody's injured, if you can get them to a hospital within that hour, chances are they're gonna make it. We didn't care if it was a U.S. soldier, if it was a Navy sailor, if it was a Marine, if it was an Iraqi citizen, or it was even a Iraqi prisoner of war, if somebody was hurt, we were called to go do these types of things. When the phone call comes in, or the bell goes off, you have 15 minutes to gather up all your stuff, get out to the aircraft, get it spun up, and get airborne, and start going to wherever the injury is. It's about... January, February time frame, and it's in the 30s. It's a clear blue sky day, not very dusty. I'm standing one of the alerts, and the call comes in that we have to go up to this prison complex called Buka Prison near the town of Basra, Iraq. This is known to be a kind of a hotbed of insurgency, but it's daytime, it's a nice day out. You normally don't fly during the day because you don't want to get shot at. It's better to fly at night. It's one of those things, it's a beautiful day. How bad could it be? Me, my crew, and a second crew take off and launch and go to pick up some sort of injury. As we get on scene and land, and we see standing out in front of us is a doctor, somebody who looks like an interpreter, a lady dressed from head to toe in a burqa, holding something in her hand, and then somebody on a stretcher, tended by four soldiers. So my crewmen run out, and mind you, these crewmen are anywhere from about 19 to 24 years old. All the other pilots except me were somewhere in the 22 to 26 year old range. Everybody's really young, and I'm the old guy of the group. These guys run out and try and figure out what's going on and what has to happen. And what they find out, they come back and they say, hey, sir, we've got a baby, about four years old, or Iraqi, that has been burnt by a kerosene heater. What had happened was they used kerosene to fill up their space heaters and this young boy had pulled this heater down on himself and basically caught himself on fire. And he was burnt something like 60 to 80% over his body. And they got him on a stretcher, he's full of morphine, he's all burrito wrapped up in a blanket. 
His mom is the lady in the burqa, and then there's an interpreter and a doctor. Doctor comes over to me and says, hey, are you willing to take him? We got to get him north. We're going to try and get him all the way to Germany from southern Iraq. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. We're going to take him to another base about two hours to the north of us and transfer him to some army helicopters, which will take him even further to Baghdad, and then he'll jump on an Air Force plane and go to Germany. That's the plan. And so we're kind of making this up as we go along. But I got great crewmen and I got these great medical techs that contend to him. I got an interpreter, his mom's coming along, though I can't talk to her except through the interpreter. So we're good, right? We think we know what we're doing. The only problem is, again, it's daytime and it's over a hotbed of insurgent activity. So it's not gonna be a smooth, easy flight. It's gonna be down low, as fast as you can go, bobbing and weaving, trying to avoid getting shot at, sometimes flying in between buildings just to get out of the city and get north. So they start loading the kid up into the helicopter. Talk to my co-pilot, a young lady. She's, I think, 23 years old, great pilot. I'm like, okay, you're gonna do the majority of the flying. We're not gonna fly straight and level at all. Tell Dash 2 that they just need to hold on and stay with us, and we're gonna go as fast as we can. She's like, I got it, sir. I talk to the crewman and say, hey, make sure you take care of this kid. And they're like, hey, we got it, sir, no big deal. He's good, we'll just monitor him for stability. They said, hey, what's that bag in the mom's hand? And the crewman said, sir, it's burgers, fries, and it looks like a Coke of some sort. The docs that had treated the kid on the base, there was a little kiosk at the US base, and because the mom hadn't had food, they got her the burger and the fries and the Coke. I'm like, okay, through the interpreter, tell the mom, don't eat while we're flying because she's probably gonna get airsick. It's not gonna be a smooth ride. It's gonna get really bumpy. They're like, Roger that, sir, got it. She's not gonna eat, we'll tell the interpreter. So we take off and we go north, and believe me, my co-pilot was flying the heck out of that aircraft. We're up 50 feet, down 50 feet. We're flying well below 100 feet as fast as we can, bobbing and weaving, just like you would see in the movies. I'm holding on for dear life. She's doing a great job. Dash 2 is trying to keep up with us. We're doing what we need to do to stay safe. And as we kind of smooth out, you know, 50 feet across the desert, going as hard as we can to get out of Dodge, my crewman in the back, the medical techs, say, hey, sir, you need to look back here. Are you saying this, sir? You got to take a look. And I said, what's up? They said, the kid's having a great time. This is a kid who's burned like 60% over his body. He's in great pain. He's all doped up on morphine to kill the pain. And I look back, and the kid has sat up in the stretcher, and his arms are hanging out the gunner's door there, and his hair's blowing back in the wind, and he's got the biggest smile on his face, and you can almost hear him screaming, rock on, this is awesome. He's just having the best time, and everybody's laughing at that. <laughs> Now I'm looking back at this kid who's about as old as my son is at that time. And uh, the kid turns to me and I'm looking at him for a second and I get the biggest toothy smile and he gives me a thumbs up. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is the best day of flying I've ever had. We're in a combat zone, it's dangerous. I'm helping a kid out. I got a great crew of sailors around me and we're flying our nation's best aircraft in my opinion. And then I hear, oh, sir, don't look back here anymore. I said, what's up? And I turn around and look, and I see that the mom had actually eaten the burger and fries. And unfortunately, she's got the bag over her face. And uh, let's just say the fries and burger didn't stay in her stomach that long. So we end up with basically two medevacs because the mom's air sick and the kid is all burnt. The epilogue to that story is that we get the kid all the way to Ali Air Base, and about a week later, I'm reading Stars and Stripes over there, and I read about this young boy that the U.S. military, Air Force, Army, and a bunch of Navy guys from Kuwait had flown for something like 14 hours to get him to Landstuhl, Germany, to help that little boy survive. I don't know where he is today, but at least for the time we were over there, they were able to treat that boy and keep him alive. That's the best flying day I've ever had. You see a lot of people today who are survivors of these extremely traumatic injuries because we've been able to get them to some sort of higher level care within that hour, the golden hour. 
that's the kind of legacy that you leave when you are doing missions like that. And that's the kind of stuff you do on a daily basis in the Navy. It is a job worth doing, and it is a team worth serving with. I bleed Navy blue and gold. It's the best way to say it. If you want to hear more stories like mine, subscribe to Sea Story today. Sea Story is brought to you by America's Navy. Learn more at Navy.com.